People need to understand what the old ones believed about death and why they believe such things. It has been said that we came from the stars and that we will return there. We will go back to the stars. It's the great mystery. It is the place from where we came and the place we are destined to go. We will all go there someday, but time, war, and disease have made us forget it. It is time to remember. These are the most visible remnants of America's ancient mound builders. They made hundreds of thousands of mounds. Some of them were pyramid shaped and others were massive conical heaps. The largest pyramid shaped mounds were as tall as 10 story buildings with a base larger than the Great Pyramid at Giza. Mound builders also constructed thousands of earthen effigy mounds depicting various animals and they made thousands of complex geometric earthworks that defy simple descriptions. The largest and most complex geometric earthworks in the world were made by these enigmatic people thousands of years ago. The first mounds in America were constructed nearly 6,000 years ago, but about 3,000 years ago the practice of mound building increased to astonishing levels. Many of their dead were cremated and buried in simple conical mounds. These burial mounds were sometimes erected over special mortuary buildings where the dead were prepared and given ceremonies to send them on their way. The buildings were usually burned when the bodies were cremated and the mound was made on top of the ashes. Then another mortuary building was made and the process was repeated. These mounds got larger and larger over time. Some of the dead, especially those of the elite ruling classes and the priests and the shaman, were placed in elaborate stone tombs with huge mounds erected over them. They put the most important people in the stone tombs and sometimes arranged the remains of those who served them in circular patterns like wheel spokes. The elite were often described as giants, a hereditary class of rulers and priests who were seven to eight feet tall. Over 30 of them have been found in mounds constructed several thousand years ago. Their origin is a mystery, but it's close to being solved. In the 1800s and 1900s, tens of thousands of America's mounds were excavated. The skeletal remains of the dead were often displayed in museums and millions of artifacts were found with burials. Many artifacts displayed incredible symbols that have long been a complete mystery to archaeologists. Symbols of crosses, circles, snakes, feathered serpents, raptor birds, forked eyes, and people dressed as various animals were found on artifacts. Single bones were often depicted on artifacts along with wide-eyed skulls and skulls with fire-like protrusions coming from the mouth. But one of the most interesting symbols found on many burial goods is what is referred to as the eye in hand. The 
vast majority of these symbols were found at mound complexes in the south. Initially, the symbols were attributed to a southern death cult. Today, it is known as the Southeastern Ceremonial Complex. The true meaning of the symbols was long thought by archaeologists to be an insolvable mystery. But starting in the 1990s, an annual workshop was held at Texas State University by a large group of archaeologists, anthropologists, and ethnography experts. They found the answers they sought, but astonishingly, the answers were found primarily in books from the 1700s and 1800s. Books that were ignored by modern archaeologists who had focused on excavating and collecting burial mounds. My ancestors had shaman medicine men and medicine women, holy people who knew the secrets of life and death. When the white man came, most of our people died or were forced to move. Many have forgotten the secrets. Many no longer cared. They only wanted to survive. Some of the old ones told the whites the secrets. The whites wrote it down in books, books that also became forgotten and lost in time. The mystery starts with our Mother Earth, the substance from which all things are made. All things are alive. All things contain the spirit from the Mother. The soil, the trees, the plants, the rocks, the waters, the animals of the forest, even the air we breathe, all things have spirit. We live in the middle world. All objects in the world come from the earth. But there is also a world above in the sky and a world below. Each of these worlds has great powers and they are connected together by a great pole. Our shaman and medicine people can move through these worlds using rituals to gain knowledge and understanding. The power of the upper and lower worlds also use this pole to influence and enter our middle world. When a body is formed from the earth, it has a living spirit that is given to it by the earth. In your world, you call it the life soul. This life soul makes the body move and gives it energy, but it has no mind, no memory. Our ancestors showed it as a bone or skull. But there is another soul, one that first came from the sky world. It is what you would call a free soul. It has memory. It has free will. And it is what many people would see as our true soul. When we die, the free soul leaves the body. The old one showed it as fire coming from the skull. The free soul will stay near its body for a time after the person dies. But in three days, it must take a sacred journey. During this time, the body, with its life soul still clinging to its bones, must be handled with care by the living. For some who have died, the body is prepared by removing the flesh and the bones are eventually burned. This burning returns the life soul back to the earth. When this is done, the life soul and its free soul can no longer join together. When this ceremony takes place matters much. It must take place in the winter, so bones are sometimes stored by the dead one's family until winter time for the ceremony. Sometimes the body of a dead leader would be prepared and placed in a tomb without being burned. This meant at a later time, the free soul and life soul of this person could rejoin. It meant that this person might return to this world someday. The ideas revealed in these beliefs incorporate the possibility of reincarnation 
and are quite similar to those of ancient Egyptians and other ancient cultures. The origin of the death journey ideas is another mystery. Many modern archaeologists and historical researchers such as Britain's Andrew Collins believe that the Salutrian culture from Europe may have brought these ideas to the Americas as early as 19,000 years ago. Collins thinks that the beliefs about the death journey emerged when the Cygnus constellation served as the North Pole Star some 18,000 to 19,000 years ago. The cremation of the dead is often seen as a way of returning the flesh to its origin and thereby releasing the soul from its imprisonment in physical matter. The soul is then released to allow it to return to its source. When the free soul starts its journey from its body, it goes to the west, where there are trials and tasks on the journey to the west. But after a few days, the free soul reaches a vast body of water. The water is the surface of the underworld. In the summer, the underworld is ruled by a feathered serpent who flies in the sky in the south. He is made of stars and has a giant red eye. In the winter, he goes back to the underworld where he does not need wings. So he is a giant snake or a water panther. The constellation of Scorpius is now known to be the Native American depiction of the feathered serpent. The bright red star and Teres served as the serpent's eye. Scorpius is visible in the nighttime southern sky in the summer, but in the winter, the constellation doesn't rise above the horizon. The mound builders believed that the free soul needed to make its journey in the winter so that the feathered serpent wasn't watching and listening. When the free soul stands at the water's edge, it waits to the early morning when a large hand is seen to fall in the western sky. The soul must jump into the sky, or it will roam in the westlands forever as a ghost. When the hand is about to fall, the soul makes a leap into a special spot in the palm of the hand. Many people say it is an eye, but it is an ogi, a slit in the sky that leads to the path of souls. Some call this opening the hand star. There are several legends about the hand in the sky and the Oji in its palm. Some tribal stories relate that in the distant past, a set of twins tried to block the Oji. One of them had his hand cut off at the wrist. His hand was placed in the sky as a warning to others. The severed wrist of the hand is formed by the three belt stars of the constellation of Orion. The thumb and fingers of the hand are outlined by various stars in the constellation and the Oji is actually Orion's Nebula. The ancient Maya also believed that Orion's Nebula was a portal into the sky, calling it Shilbaba. But reaching this portal was only the first part of the sky journey. Some tribes saw the hand star and the Ogi as a spider woman. She can grab the soul of those who lack courage or those who don't reach the Oki. Some of these souls are cast into the underworld and some are cast back to the earth to live again and correct their errors. But those who make the jump to the Oki are soon moved to the true path. The path of souls, the river of souls, and the wolf trail are all the same thing. It is a stream of stars that moves across the sky. When the spirit makes it to the Ogi and unto the path, it falls safely into the underworld, where it will arise the next night to start the final journey.
When the Han constellation falls below the horizon in the early morning hours, the Milky Way is seen as a horizontal band across the sky. In the winter months, it descends like a wall, falling below the horizon just as the sun rises. The Milky Way is the path of souls, and it is believed that the stars of the Milky Way are souls making the journey. The soul has many adventures and trials on the path. These adventures test the strength and goodness of the soul. If the soul stumbles and falls, it can fall back to the earth or fall into the underworld to be lost for all time. But if the soul passes these tests, it reaches a split in the road, a place where it must decide to go one way or the other. One path is a dead end where the soul is trapped. The other path leads on. It is here where the path splits the soul has its final test. A large creature stands. Most of us believe it is a large bird, an eagle, falcon, or hawk. The bird judges the soul on its bravery and goodness. It sees how well the soul served its people and how it dealt with its enemies. Those who fail this test are blotted from existence. They are erased from the world. Their memories and thoughts are blotted out. But those who pass the test are allowed to pass through a great opening in the sky world to join with their ancestors who made the same journey long ago. In the past, this hole in the sky was in the north where all revolved around it. Now it is in the top of the sky dome. The spot on the path of souls where there are two different ways to go is located at the dark rift of the Milky Way. It was at this spot where the soul had to choose a direction and also where the soul encountered a creature serving as a judge. The judge, described in tribal lore as an adversary to the soul, was at the constellation of Cygnus, located at the beginning of the dark rift. The actual portal into the sky world, the portal to the afterlife, was probably the star Deneb, the brightest star of Cygnus. Many symbols that were once interpreted as sun worship iconography are now known to represent the fork of the Milky Way at the dark rift and the hole at the center representing Deneb. The fork was depicted on many artifacts and on body tattoos and face painting. Several key artifacts that were found in mounds show all the elements of the death journey. These beliefs are sacred knowledge, knowledge that has been too long forgotten. We are a conquered people, a forgotten people, a people who have been pushed from our land and made to forget our ways. There is truth in our ways, and our true destiny is revealed in the death journey. It is time to remember, time to remember where we came from and where we will go.